Thank you. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started here. So welcome to our panel uh, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, the current state and where we go from here. Um, so for the panel, we have Nick, Chitra, and Javon here with us. And I'm Rita Chaturvedi. I work for Morgan Stanley, been there for about 12 years now. Um, and I work in the technology division uh, in Morgan Stanley. I'm going to allow my panelists to introduce themselves first before we jump into the discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So Nick, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. Pleasure to meet each and every one of you. My name is Nick Fuller. Um, I run distributed cloud research at IBM, Vice President Distributed Cloud. That entails applying AI technologies to the software delivery lifecycle in multiple domains, inclusive of journey to cloud and edge computing. Hi, Chitra Hota. Um, I work for Oak Tree Capital Management. I'm the CTO and the head of data technology and architecture. I've been there for about 16 months now. Uh, prior to that, I was at JP Morgan as a CTO. Um, and then before that, Morgan Stanley. That's how I know <laughs> Rita. Hi, I'm Javon Beckles. Um, I'm a lead developer at ScottLogic, where um, you know we help so it's a consultancy in the UK. Um, I'm also a, a diversity and inclusion ambassador for, for that and a FINUS DEI member. Thank you, Nick, Chitra, and Javon for being here. Um, so we, we all keep hearing about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And equity and inclusion are more recent additions to the conversation. Diversity is what we used to speak about more in the past. Um, and we hear a lot of stats around how uh, the companies that are branded as diverse and inclusive have a better chance at being successful uh, in acquiring business or um, getting success over their competitors in the marketplace. And there are studies from McKinsey and Gartner and all of these companies um, that place a measure value on what their edge can be. Uh, and yet, uh, we see that um, there is still a lot of conversation that needs to happen in this regard and a lot of progress that is still uh, needed in this area. So my first question to Chitra is, what more and, and should be done to improve the diversity, especially at the leadership and executive levels, uh, potentially unlocking more business and social value? Great question. Uh, what the best thing that we can do is ensure that once you have a seat at the table, you are constantly uh, speaking out for diversity. You are looking at the uh, hiring panels, making sure there are diverse candidates in the hiring panels. Measure uh, these KPIs and statistics along um, in the organization as well as in your leadership team. Ensure that they are hiring uh, a diverse panel. And more, more than that, uh, is be a good role model. Speak up. Um, be there to mentor because that's another thing and advocate for the fact that uh, women um, candidates or diverse candidates have to apply for a job even though they don't meet 100% of the capabilities that are advertised because you can help them grow in the job by mentoring. Um, uh, we've done a lot of things in Oak Tree. We, are, um, we have programs called RISE. So once uh, women get promoted into or diverse candidates for it, MD, uh, we are a VP level position, even SVP for that matter. We start um, coaching them. We have sessions for them. Uh, we mentor them. Uh, we send them over to training so that we are growing a pipeline from within the firm if you're not finding a pipeline outside of the firm. And that has helped, especially in investment and in technology fields where the candidate pool is very, very low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's really good. Nick, what would you uh, want to say about this particular question where what more can be done? Yeah, so fantastic points raised by Chitra. Getting to the retention end of the equation is really critical as it relates to sponsorship, as it relates to filling exec positions that begin to represent what the globe looks like, what the planet looks like. The supply side of that equation is really critical too in terms of recruitment. And when you look at stats provided by the Computing Research Association, for example, they published something known as the Taube Report on an annual basis. The Taube Report shows uh, on the order of 1% to low single digit percent for black and Latino respectively at the bachelor's level, at the PhD level, excuse me, about 20% uh, female. 
and as you go uh, in earlier degree progression, master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, the numbers rise, but never approaching for the US, for example, national demographic numbers. So clearly a lot has to be done on the retention side, the recruitment side of the equation, excuse me, both sides, uh, candidly, uh, to increase that pipeline so that you have more to sponsor as it relates to executive roles, uh, mid-level management roles, and ultimately entry-level roles. Yeah, great points. Thank you both. Uh, Javon, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think that, that, um, that intentionality around um, getting, getting the, the, the candidates into the positions in, in what would otherwise be, oh, you know, they didn't meet the criteria, or, or you know, they, they, they're, not, they're just not out there, so, so um, don't, don't, um, don't go for it. That, that's, that's the main key. That, that's the important thing to, to you know, hold on to. And you know, good examples. By, by yeah, I, I like that. The intentionality is is really really important for the firms to not just do lip service, but really do something tangible in this regard. And um, creating programs that will give you measurable benefits uh, and measurable results uh, is really really important. Um, Nick, my next question is to you. In your experience. Uh, do you have any examples where you or others that you, you may have interacted with used your position to improve diversity in your companies? Yeah, so we undertook a major endeavor uh, at IBM several years ago, pre the uh, unfortunate events of 2020, where we really spread our wings beyond the usual sources. The usual sources being first line managers go to their alma maters where they have relationships and they recruit individuals to ultimately bring into their organizations as they have hiring ships, hiring tickets. We created a really broad based effort attending uh, diversity specialized conferences in addition to the ones that we typically would go to in addition to career fairs, TAPIA, Society of Women Engineers, those are a few examples and there are many more out there. And today when you attend one of those conferences, everybody's there. Everybody in the financial sector and other sectors, technology service providers, etc. So they're all competing for the same talent. And what did we talk about before? That talent pool is a lot smaller. It doesn't meet national demographic standards. So the recruitment methods are ultimately have to go even beyond the college's level all the way to the high school level. So one of the things we did fairly recently was to establish you know, we were having a lunchtime discussion on quantum, and quantum is certainly on the rise. There are other technologies, of course, that are mainstream today. We established a quantum uh, research consortia with uh, historically black colleges and universities, Morehouse College, my alma mater, and many others. So they are actually hitting the nail on the head as it relates to how you specifically grow that pipeline. I've been a critical part of many of these endeavors myself, and, and we're seeing some fruit. Our numbers don't look like national demographics yet, but you're in it for the long game. You're in it for the long haul. It's not something that you solve in a one hiring cycle or two hiring cycles. Absolutely. We're in this for a long haul, for sure. Um, Chitra, anything to add there? Sure. So we've also been through several of these initiatives. We have all finance. Uh, we go to you know, historically black colleges. And we've partnered with other uh, asset management firms on this one, including Apollo and Aries. Um, we also have uh, Wharton Women in Investing. Like Howard is a big sponsor of that is from Martin. So we hold those conferences, we sponsor them. So we want to encourage uh, women in the investment management space. They're very few, just like technology. In the technology space, uh, I, I remember when I was in college um, and uh, entered my first job, I was the only woman engineer trainee in a batch of like 52. Very awkward, but I mean, that's the reality. So I made a conscious effort that I have to start mentoring the, um, the, the ladies right from like middle school into high school and have them select technology jobs because if you don't select technology careers or jobs you will never be in that pipeline i know it's difficult women drop off but the encouragement and having that role model in front of you which i never had when i started is very key because they, if you see somebody that looks like you you know what good looks like a great looks like and you want to be that so that's something that i always try to i, I try I try to um, promote yeah and uh, um, I have benefited from from that and uh, I'm sure a lot of other people benefit from seeing role models uh, not just women but also all diversity categories sure. um, so it's really important to be able to see leaders who look like you um, for you to be to aspire to become like them one day um, Javon anything you would like to add here uh, I'd, I'd really like to um, uh, 
reiterate what what um what Chitra has said in terms of that that mentality of you know you you would have seen somebody or you you know you might be the person um but then passing it forward being being that person to say okay here is somebody um that i can identify and and try to to, to bring up or, or help to promote and and you know we don't often do that in our careers we kind of look, look for ourselves and and i think it's 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 that broader um looking out and you know very much like the open source mentality um i think somebody mentioned in a, a talk earlier you know that that responsibility of of taking the opportunity that that somebody has given you but also providing opportunity for others as well yeah absolutely um moving on to the next question um uh, there are again reports from several accredited organizations um there is one particular report uh, which Deloitte published in 2022 where they said that um positive workplace culture is one of the top values that attract millennials to organizations um there are there is a, a survey that Forbes did Uh, which said that psychological safety has become more and more important in organizations um, and attracts talent to organizations that provide psychological safety to their employees um with more employees expecting these organizational behaviors um i'll start with nick you have you seen any changes in workplace to improve employees feeling of belonging or encouraging psychological safety at work Yeah, I know fantastic question. So engagement is a critical part of retention, clearly. And significant part of engagement is that sense that I'm in a safe environment where if uh, project-wise I'm unhappy, if uh there's challenges in the relationship between teammates, between managers, etc., you need avenues, you need vehicles to be able to reach out to and communicate such concerns. a measurement of that engagement process on some type of frequency be it annual be it biennial is quite typical of many organizations today and ensuring that there is no retaliatory methods uh, employed by management and other leaders as it relates to that feedback we are personally measured on that at IBM and i know many other organizations are engaged in such measurements so that you have that feeling of comfort and safety I'll give you a personal example. I recently uh, conducted my own engagement, <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of positive feedback, and, and there was critical feedback as well as it relates to. There was one individual who was just uncomfortable with lunchtime conversations. This was approaching uh, the election cycle, and there were lunchtime conversations at the table regarding, you know, who, who is on one side versus the other, or in the middle, what have you. Uh, and that particular individual was uncomfortable with such discussions, and shared that as part of the engagement process. and that was critical i took the opportunity as part of that feedback to say you know uh this is a safe space we have to be able to share that thought and ultimately we're a company that doesn't lean left right or in the middle we work with any organization we work with any political organization and so this is a critical part of who we are as an organization so i think we're trending in that right direction uh more of that needs to happen i hear stories from other uh parts of the industry that suggests that we still have more to do in order to get to that you know asymptotic perfection yeah absolutely um anything to add jivan yeah i think um to like again brit brilliant question um it's it's very easy to 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 think oh you know the organization needs to be the the, the person um leader in the sense quite rightly so i think i think it's important that the the organization put put their, their steps out and their efforts out and think Yes, we want to do this and we're going in this direction. However, this is new for everybody. And I think that you know there may be fear that oh you know I I need to get it right first time or I need to to be able to 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 um engage everybody and 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 make sure that or you know we don't we're not getting involved in that because that's a that's a topical issue uh you know similar to to the next point. So that acceptance that that understanding that maturity of both um the, the the management in in trying to do stuff let's try to do something but also um that maturity of 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 the staff employees citizens you know we could we could extend that that um that that idea just accept that mistakes will be made and if a mistake is made 
we learn from it and grow from it. it, it it's not, it's not going to be one off. So I think it's important on both sides when engaging in that kind of um, activity that, that we, we, we go to it from you know, those, those two sides of it. That's a very positive outlook on this. Um, Chitra, any thoughts on... Yeah, so every leader has that uh, responsibility to ensure that they give safe space not to just their team, but to, to the broader teams in general, right? So retaliation uh, is, is something that we also are very aware of and we make sure the feedback is taken very candidly and acted upon. Second thing I would want to mention is the employee networks, right? They are very good safe spaces for, to talk because you're outside your domain of work and you're mingling with other people in the organization. So we have uh, LGBTQ networks. Um, we have uh, networks for um, uh, for native uh, cultural groups. We also have network women's leadership network where we have a safe haven where we talk about issues at, at a leadership level, like what issues do you face? For example, um, one of the things that always comes up is microaggressions when it comes to women, right? So at, at the table, so what are we doing? As a leader, when I see microaggression happening at the table, I always speak up and say, hey, that was a great idea. Why don't you help explain it? When somebody else is taking over the idea and speaking about it, right? So things like that, if you make that conscious effort as a leader and show that you care, automatically it's contagious. So the inclusive behavior and the, the biases kind of dissolve um, and the inclusive behavior is actually promoted. So that's something that each one of us actually owes to, to, the, to the broader community. Yeah, and it starts a positive cycle of keep That's giving right. forward. Yes. Um, uh, if you have received that allyship and advocacy from somebody, then you just pay it forward from there. Um, my next question is actually related to, um, you said microaggression, um, subconscious biases. We are very aware of those now than we used to be even five years back. Um, there is a lot of conversation about subconscious biases in workplace. Um, it can be small things like saying, oh, you come from X, Y, and Z country and you have such an impeccable dressing sense. Um, you may be thinking in your mind that you're giving a compliment to somebody, but they can take it as bias um, and, and so on. So what are, uh, I'll start with you, Javon, on this question. What are your thoughts on subconscious bias in workplace and how would you go about creating a safe environment to address these biases? Yeah, um, well, I think the first thing to, to start off with is that everybody has biases, whether we admit it or not, right? Um, some, some people have better uh, control of it than, than others, but I think the, that, that is the starting point um, from which we, we, should, we, should, we should go. Um, things like policies um, for, for, for guiding behavior, I mean, positive behavior, and, and identifying what is negative behavior is important, um, and, 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 and we should really um, try to incorporate that into, into you know, corporate uh, policies and um, ways of working and all, all those kinds of things. Um, but you know, fundamentally, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a people thing. And I, you know, and I, I go back to, to that previous point. We, we are all human. Um, we, we, you know, mis mistakes, mistakes can be made. So somebody had, you know, might, might have a bias and might need to be, you know, as 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 Shisha said, be, be pointed out that this 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 is not not acceptable, and in identifying that, in the time, that maturity to take that on, you know, okay, I've I've done something wrong, it's been pointed out, and not retaliate, but but really, you know, try to to, to take that on board, and of course there are there are uh, ways to 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 um, to to do that, you know, it's con conflict is, is 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 never easy to deal with. But um, approaching it in this in this way, I think, is is is, is important. Having that that common understanding that we we're, we're here to improve each other. Absolutely. So basically, creating a uh, an environment of trust where people feel comfortable uh, pointing out when bias happens, but also the people who may have um, done the bias or unconsciously, of course, um, that for them to accept it and be prepared to remediate the behavior going forward, right? Um, Nick, what are your thoughts on this? 
Yeah, Javon is spot on. Uh, guidelines around business conduct as it relates to implicit bias is, is a critical part of not just human resources, uh, uh, meeting that out and communicating that to teams across organizations, but teams adopting that from a cultural standpoint, making it very much intrinsic to who you are as an, an organization and as a company. I think that just allows for a level of consistency such that it doesn't even begin to appear as you get to a level of maturity in the growth of an organization's culture. But that does take time if an organization is new to this and uh, these policies are now being implemented for the first time. Uh, but I totally agree, this has to be a, a foundational part of who you are from a business conduct standpoint with regular training that occurs at some frequency, be that once a year, twice a year, what have you, uh, for that organization. And importantly and critically, manifested by leadership. Leadership has to lead the way uh, in ultimately making that a cultural sticking point for that organization. Yeah, very, very valid points. Thank you. Um, Chitra, I'm going to just tweak it slightly from, from your standpoint. Uh, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, a big part of equity is pay parity. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Great question. So if, if you've been following the U.S. Census, um, women make, I believe, 83 cents uh, for every dollar that a man makes. And some of the things that have happened in the recent um, past is now the salaries are uh, being published. As New York just started. It's going to happen in California as well and a couple of other states. That's a very good way of bringing uh, parity to, um, to pay. Um, the other thing is, uh, if, if you are aware of uh, a pay equity uh, not happening, there's, you see a discrepancy between a male or, um, or a female candidate or another diverse candidate versus um, a general candidate, then speak up and bring about that change. That's the other thing that we need to do. And also remove that um, unconscious bias in the hiring process, right? Because uh, the role... Um, should be um, agnostic of gender, right? It should be, it should be agnostic of uh, color, race, creed, any, any of that. It should be just about the role, right? So that's another thing that we can do. So good, good, all the companies are bringing in pay equity, and that's a really good place to be now. And it's helping a lot of women. Do you think there is still enough transparency about what the justif justifiable salary is for a position because the ranges that I've seen are all over the place like a hundred thousand range from you know start to end for a particular position it's a start but you know I would say uh, you owe it to yourself as a woman to ask for what is rightly rightfully yours right if you don't do that, the other thing that we do is we don't change jobs that often I would encourage like three to four years learn a new trade or learn a new um, uh, stack and then change jobs because that's the best way to get promoted. I have used that in the past, best way to get a pay hike. Um, and of course, you have to work hard, we all do, uh, to pick up that, but you can always pick it up. Great. Um, I was just reading up uh, something I wanted to share, the great breakup, I don't know if everyone has heard about <laughs> it, where women are leaving in throngs um, and it, one of the biggest reasons is lack of pay parity and uh, organizations, according to a Gartner report, organizations that are going to work on pay parity will have at least 30 to 40 percent chance of keeping those women at the organization than the organization that are not really paying much attention to this. So um, again, something to take away. Um, we only have three more minutes left. So I would like to open up to our audience at this point and see if there are any questions for the panelists here. Yes, please. Hi. Um, so we're talking about some pretty difficult professions, right, finance and tech. And yet we're also talking about, you guys have all mentioned, kind of psychological safety and feedback and engagement. So how do you kind of thread the balance, you know, with very performance and, you know, long hours kind of roles with, I hear you and I want you to feel safe talking to me about what's going on with you. Like, how do you find that, that appropriate balance? You want to take that? Yeah, sure, I can take it. Any role in technology, any role uh, that is a professional role spanning a range of industries requires you to deliver value. It starts with that. No one is hiring you per se because of a demographic. They are hiring you because of the ability, the potential ability for you to deliver value. 
That's number one. Now, once you are associated with returning value on that investment, absolutely, you have a safe space, right? As it relates to a range of, oh, you should have a safe space. Leadership is there to help enforce that. But they go together, right? We, we actually literally, I swear you had a direct link into a staff meeting we had fairly recently, but this is a discussion we just had because we are working more, right? Uh, there was significant competition coming out and continues to happen that way with the pandemic. And so want, folks want to know, okay, yes, I have to do this, I have to run fast, but I also have these other things that are appearing, right? How do you help me with productivity? How do you help me with a whole range of other issues so that, yes, I can complain, so to speak, to leadership to help make things more efficient. But at the end of the day, delivering value is critical. Yes. So we um, talked a lot about bias and uh, safe space and creating that, and a lot of that falls on the leadership, which I really appreciate you saying that because I'm sure there's a lot of leaders in the room here. But what, what do you do in the hiring process? What traits do you look for for candidates to make sure that when they come in, they're going to fit the culture that you want and really drive home the point of inclusion, which I think, like you said, Rita, is a newer emphasis that we have in the organization. I can take that. Yeah. So there are a couple of things you can do. So um, you don't always have to hire for fit for the culture. Sometimes you need to change the culture a bit also. So you have to look for, um, for I look for growth. Can that person grow in this organization? What kind of leadership uh, skills is the person bringing to the table? Right? And then a lot, of the, a lot of the gaps can actually be filled by mentorship if you don't find the perfect candidate. But you have to ensure that the pipeline that you're hiring for is very consistent and it's helping you grow your organization to make it much more inclusive because I've always felt that I have, if I have representation across my table, I get a better product, I'm delivering faster, and I'm also ensuring that I have efficiency in my entire pipeline, right? Because those ideas are helping me become better. Not just become better as an organization, but become better as a leader because there's reverse mentoring happening when you learn from the candidates that you hire. Uh, so all, all, all of it, all of it works. I mean, can, can I just add to that sure. in that, um, like, we, we forget that, that people's interactions go beyond the, the company or a company, right? And I think the more that a company can fill the gaps that a, that a person lives, as many gaps, and I mean, you can definitely, you can't fill all the gaps, but the more gaps that you can fill in their in the career development, the better, the better the, the company will do for attracting, you know, maintaining, developing, and, and, and ultimately retaining. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, the companies are basically, they have the ability to make an impact on the society, and that's where this is even more important that we start it within our organizations and influence the rest of the society along with um, our own organizations. So I know we are seeing a stop sign in the back. <laughs> Maybe one uh, more. I think we had one more question yeah, then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, please. So I know in a lot of the DEI initiatives, we talk more closely from the perspective of the, of the supply, so usually the diverse population. But I'm curious about any metrics or measures of success that are not um, strictly from the perspective of like counting the population of diverse species. So like how do we include non-diverse people and how we measure success of like facilitating that pipeline, community of sustaining, you know, diversity in the organization? I can go. Yeah. You, can, you have to start early, first of all. Start uh, at the uh, middle school, high school level. Then the other thing that's encourage people to apply, even though they do not meet 100% of the job criteria. That's the other thing where we see, especially for women, if they don't fit the bill 100%, they don't apply. But I don't see that for, for men. So that's another thing that I would say, like, even if you don't fit the bill 100%, do apply for that job because you can always grow into that role. Into that role. Yeah, and hiring managers have to, conversely, they have to become a bit more flexible in um, really identifying what are the core requirements of the role. And as long as the person is meeting those core requirements, everything else can be flexible. Um, but, you know, to your, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, was, I was just going to say, yeah. sorry, um, I kind of want to turn this on its head a bit. Yeah. In the sense that we really shouldn't be 
So yes, metrics and, and that kind of thing is important. But I think we, we kind of need to get to the stage of, of almost continuous reflection where, because you, know, you, could, you could identify groups and say, oh, you know, we, we, we are now including this group and that group and that group. But somewhere along that process, if somebody gets left, left out um, inadvertently, right, that's, that's, that's still a problem. And that's you know, part of the reason why, why we have the societies that we have today. And I think that you know, in inculcating a cu culture of continuous reflection. Who am I excluding? Who is not getting the best? Who is, you know, that I think is, 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 the, is the stage that we need to get to rather than just looking at numbers or, or anything like that. Sure. All right. So with that, we will wrap up our discussion. Thank you again, Nick, Chitra, and Jerome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.